awaken my child and embrace the glory that is your birthright. Know that I am the Overmind, the eternal will of the Swarm, and that you have been created to serve me. Finding is suspect. The AI did it with no difficulty level. The animations, controls, unit selection and queuing are all limited with no idle worker button. And the game's flat 2D engine was old hat on a technical level even when it was released. Structures don't cost money until they're built and are cancelled if units are in the way. It's not on Steam or GOG.com, the base game is free but the remaster is paid for and both digital versions need a separate launcher from which not all the community content is compatible anymore. Oh, and the cutscenes are dated and there's some weird cartoon skin now. Yep, that's about it. That's every complaint I have about StarCraft in less than a minute. StarCraft has been lurking like a defiler in the background of my content for months now. This is understandable as I've covered both of Blizzard's previous RTS titles in other videos. This also means I've already talked about their ascent from plucky porting company Silicon and Synapse to the gaming powerhouse they became in the mid-90s. Hot off the back of their latest Warcraft success, Blizzard unveiled a prototype of StarCraft, which looked like nothing more than a sci-fi asset flip of Warcraft 2. Because that's what it was! This didn't set the world on fire, so they had to go back to the drawing board and overhaul it. And taking cues from Age of Empires, their resulting isometric RTS prototype garnered a better response. Despite this seemingly miraculous shift to pre-rendered sprite-based goodness, the old Warcraft 2 engine was struggling and needed a complete refit over the course of two months. This led to further delays as the company got all their zerglings in a row and fans became increasingly impatient. It released in March of 1998 and became the best-selling PC game that year, with 1.5 million copies sold. The third successive year that the company had sold over a million with a new title. A stunning feat considering just how many good games they had to compete with for shelf space at the time. Unlike its predecessors, which mostly had factions that were essentially the same, StarCraft boasted three different races that were separate but equal in their abilities and power, perfectly balanced against each other in a way that had never been seen before. Everything else about the title had that typical Blizzard polish, with most of the technical features already innovated in other titles, but now shined up to a blinding degree by the design team. The extra development time resulted in a product that set the standard for how an RTS should function, to the point that it was adopted by the US Air Force as a method of teaching crisis planning and teamwork. Oh yes, Admiral, I definitely need to use that computer. I feel my crisis planning is several campaigns off being fit for duty. 
Two authorised add-ons by Stardock and Aztec New Media followed, but despite using the same engine and mechanics, they were criticised for their lacklustre story and design. They also didn't bring anything new to the table. They were completely forgotten about because Blizzard never bundled them with the game, and in their infinite wisdom released their own official expansion. Brood War arrived in December of that year and perfected the careful balance, adding an entire game's worth of additional campaigns and new units to boot that fits seamlessly in with the vanilla crowd. This has led it to be rightly touted as one of the best expansion packs ever released. Right from the get-go and to this very day, StarCraft with Brood War installed was considered the greatest real-time strategy game of all by many publications, including this channel, and was recognised by Guinness World Records as the best-selling strategy game ever, one of four records the game would go on to hold. After a stage setting opening video and a nice loading screen, you're graced with a beautiful space theme menu. The keen eyed among you will note that it's in 1080p. That's because StarCraft was remastered in 2017 with updated graphics and sound, including much needed support for modern resolutions, while miraculously maintaining compatibility for multiplayer with the standard game. No sore sports required here. Hitting single player will give you a choice between the original and expansion campaign. If you haven't played before, hit the original. You don't want to start with Brood War, trust me. Taking another leaf from the same playbook as its contemporary competitor Age of Empires, StarCraft supports multiple player campaigns on the same machine, so you're asked to enter a character name before continuing. The campaign screen is next, divided into three different episodes, based largely on the perspectives of each of the races. Rather than being the same campaign with a race selection screen, this is a free episode arc that's played sequentially. As a result, the game won't let you tackle the second second or third episodes before the first. No crazy aliens for you until you learn how to play. Unless you pick the option to play a whole host of custom single player maps for the rest of time in the game's equivalent of skirmish mode. StarCraft Remastered has plenty of options to tinker about with in terms of visual and gameplay tweaks too, so you can customise it somewhat to your liking. Multiplayer does exactly what it says on the tin and Collections adds a series of superfluous wallpapers and announcers to your game for some reason, including different skins for in-game action. This is a nod to the enormous competitive league I'll discuss later. You can also customise your hotkeys to a limited degree for micromanagement purposes. Fun! and credits are what you think they are. I really should stop ending the tour with them. Rebel Yell, the Terran campaign, gives you a few nice slideshow images to click through for flavour before you're off to boot camp in order to learn how to play. A weird computerised technical lady will brief you on the mission and then how to do basic things like order units about, build structures and harvest the two resources in the game, minerals and vespine gas. One comes in the form of expendable crystals that you harvest, much like the lumber in Warcraft. The other is more like a gaseous gold that you construct a refinery over the top of. StarCraft greets you with a nice little tip screen that you can disable and forget about forever. Then you can choose between following orders or roaming the map with your troops until you come into contact with a mysterious alien force. Before that, the men will helpfully berate you for not using the newly created attack move function. The Terrans are much like any other human beings. The vast majority of them are insufferable pieces of work. It's up to you to begrudgingly prevent their grisly deaths so they can go back to being drugged up lunatics and fight amongst themselves instead. After succeeding in your mission, you'll hear a gong, and the now standard victory screen will pop up showing how you did. General Edmund Duke will join you in one of the briefing pains of the next mission. These will gradually be populated by a growing cast of characters as you get further into the campaign, with up to three people having things to say to you in addition to your briefing lady. The vastness of space is clearly the new frontier, and the foul-mouthed colonists are heavily inspired by western films, which gives the Terran campaign a darker personality and character than Blizzard's previous cartoony RTS venture. StarCraft continues to hold your hand in the next mission, sending you to a wasteland, 
to find Marshal James Rayner in order to relocate colonists from the doomed backwater. What aids the emerging story are the newly created in-game cutscenes, where the action will pause and characters will talk to each other, further outlining opinions, motivations and what's required in the mission to come, or potential changes mid-game. Captain Rayner, I finished scouting out the area and… you pig! What? I haven't even said anything to you yet. Yeah, but you were thinking it. They're also prone to adding a nice denouement to a successful result before the victory screen hits. All of this flavour text surrounds a simple mission. Your objective is to train 10 marines, but since you already have 5, they count towards the score, making this a cakewalk. The Marshal is a strong believer in personal freedom and no fan of the Confederacy. A framing narrative is built through conversation rather than the scrolling text of previous RTS games, with you playing the silent protagonist and watching and absorbing information reminiscent of a completely different game about an alien in Invasion also released in 1998. Build your economy, train troops, take out the enemy, relocate when resources run thin, and then destroy the opposition. Classic RTS goodness and a great introduction to the mechanics for new people. So it's a nice gentle ramp up of difficulty to oh, look at that next objective. Let's hope you were listening during the last two outings, because they were glorified extensions of the tutorial. Fortunately, you have defences intact at the beginning, and it's just a matter of upgrading and training troops to ward off the Zerg assaults. This mission is an ancestor of a modern tar defence game. The strategy is known as turtling, where you cower behind a fixed shell of defences instead of striking out and attacking the enemy. You're also introduced to additional buildings and extensions, offering you new abilities and upgrades in a seamless fashion. The fourth mission gives you another campaign element, where you control Rainer and a limited selection of troops with no SCVs or resources and navigate a maze-like structure. These are generally my least favourite parts of RTS games, but as far as this type of gameplay goes, it's simple fare. The episode continues along that line with each mission having its own little twist, and you're led through an entertaining story of conflict and betrayal that truly motivates you when you're clicking all the men in buildings. Sorry Kerrigan, men and women. Oh yes, and the aliens. Lots and lots of aliens. Speaking of which, episode 2 is an intimate introduction to the first of those mysterious alien species, the Zerg. And this blew my teenage mind when I first played it 22 years ago. I was all set for a reskin of the Terran faction but with a gruesome alien bent. You know, like the orcs and humans Blizzard had graced us with in the past. Then I discovered that this strange new species was entirely unlike anything I had seen before. The Zerg are a biologically superior life form controlled by a singular mind. Their units are hatched from eggs in the hive, and despite only having one building to train creatures, you'll have no problem amassing a swarm of teeth and flesh to tear into your enemies. You don't build things either, you hatch drones who in turn evolve into the static creatures you require them to be. All of this is done on the creep, an oozing substance that will quest out further into the map the more you build upon its edges. The Zerg units are simultaneously weaker but more expendable than their opposition, and you'll find an almost callous disregard for them actually benefits you sometimes, as you wear down your enemies in a biological war of attrition that their frail bodies can't keep up with. Plus all your units and buildings naturally regenerate, which is a great benefit for those that survive. Alternatively, if you get the chance, Use the strategy that this game popularised, the Zerg Rush. Two Zerglings hatch from a single egg, meaning you can amass an army far faster than the opposition and overwhelm them through sheer numbers. Come on boys, they can't kill us all! The general structure of the missions remains the same, but the atmosphere generated by this completely new design and attitude changes it significantly, without completely throwing the player. The disgusting creatures you sought to destroy now become the tools you use to lay waste to your foes in a delightfully macabre twist. 
New music, new units, new campaign, new point of view and a different yet familiar playstyle using the same control scheme you spent the previous episode learning. They could have lengthened the Terran campaign and called it a day, selling the other races and additional games. You know, like they did with the sequel? Instead, we get three times the effort put into a single title. You'll soon charge headlong into Episode 3, leaving a bloody mess in your wake, only for StarCraft to shift chameleon-like once again. The Protoss are the most technologically advanced of the races, sporting shields that regenerate and units that are more powerful than the other factions. The trade-off is that the training and upgrading of these forces takes longer and enforces a more deliberate pace compared to their frenetic foes. Just like the Terrans, they don't care much for the swarms of Zerg that have been plaguing the universe courtesy of your antics in Episode 2, and they want them gone. They warp in most of their buildings and units from other planets and in order to facilitate this you must construct additional pylons. Pylons provide power and increase the number of units you can train, the caveat being if your enemy takes out those pylons your buildings don't function anymore. Fortunately, while it's costly to do so, once you have a pylon down you can warp in multiple buildings at a time with a single probe, negating the time penalty. It might take you longer to get going with the Protoss, but once they're fully upgraded you'll have fleets of devastating ships, enormous beings of unfathomable energy, and deadly shielded warriors worth several units from those lesser factions. And that's the beauty of StarCraft. For every advantage a side boasts, they also suffer a penalty elsewhere, and part of the joy of playing is uncovering each of these quirks and how they fit together in a seamless competitive whole. With 58 missions divided between the base game and the expansion, StarCraft gives you plenty of campaign to play with. And if you're hankering for more, there's 60 levels of varying quality in Retribution and Insurrection that aren't included by default. In addition to this, there's the two-part Unvoiced Enslavers series made to showcase the power of the campaign editor, and the fully voiced Loomings campaign which may as well be a part of the main game as it's a precursor to the first episode. Lastly, there's the Stukov series which provides three more missions from Blizzard, including a Nintendo 64 exclusive converted by fans using dark arts, not to mention the hundreds of fan campaigns and maps providing endless replayability. Up until now I've glossed over the enormous impact the multiplayer scene of StarCraft has had, particularly in South Korea, a worldwide community forged by decades of competitive play that still numbers in its millions to this day. Hundreds of thousands of people would pack arenas to witness televised competitive gaming events that were treated with all the reverence of a professional sport they were now recognised as. The popularity of StarCraft and Blizzard's spawn system, which allowed you to install a multiplayer only copy on any machine to play with friends over a network, coupled with the dawn of broadband is one of the major reasons eSports took off 20 years ago. What's that? The graphics don't do it for you? Charlatan! If that's really the case, then fear not. Mass Recall is a complete remake of StarCraft inside the engine of its much more modern sequel. It's nowhere near the same as playing the original because the design style is completely different. But for those who just can't get over the confines of the control scheme or graphics and want the story, both the mod and its prerequisites are free. The sequel? It took them 12 years. It's played by millions, and while I still prefer the original, I'd be out of my mind to call it anything but an excellent and honed RTS that more or less ended the genre. Even if I don't think the campaign or design decisions hold up when compared to its predecessor, the mechanics and graphics are obviously superior. Whatever way you choose to play it, StarCraft is a once in a generation game, right up there with the likes of Pac-Man, Tetris, Doom and Lee Carvalho's Putting Challenge. In all honesty, this video could have been over an hour long. I've only lightly touched on so many potential topics to discuss, but it's much better to experience a game like this first hand after my setting the stage for you, rather than my spoiling the entire campaign or explaining every technical detail. I'm not sure there will ever be a game quite like it again, and with it being completely free as of 2017, you owe it to yourself to download it now and see where this billion dollar franchise began. No, there's no fibre optic cable underneath those blades of grass. StarCraft might be free to play, but if you're going to download it, you'll first need to GET OFF MY LAWN!